Hello everyone, thanks for joining me as I discuss the GLIM criteria for the diagnosis of malnutrition, GLIM standing for the Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition. My name is Veronica Vessels and I am a registered dietitian in South Africa specifically. So yeah, let's get into it. This presentation will give a short overview of the article followed by some learning objectives and then the GLIM criteria will be covered according to its four levels and lastly the references will be given. So this is the article I will be discussing, the GLIM criteria for the diagnosis of malnutrition, a consensus report for the global clinical nutrition community. Please check the description box below for a link to this article. I've also created a two page protocol which you can edit, you can add your logo, you can essentially do what you want with it. And if you choose to, you can even use it in your facility or make it a protocol for your facility. So this consensus report was compiled by Cedar Home, Jensen, Korea and colleagues. Please note that this presentation only covers adults and the criteria discussed shouldn't be used to diagnose children. The global leadership conversation addressing malnutrition was held on was held at the Aspen conference on the 19th of January 2016. The breakthroughs at this meeting led to the development of the global leadership initiative on malnutrition. The meeting also identified there are many malnutrition diagnosis issues and thus a commitment was made to make a broader global consensus in defining and characterizing malnutrition. The core GLIM leadership community is comprised of the global clinical nutrition societies such as ASPEN, ESPEN, FELAMPE, F-E-L-A-N-P-E, -E, sorry if I butchered that, and the PENSA. This committee then created larger supporting working groups by inviting members to create additional global diversity and expertise. It was agreed that a series of face-to-face -face meetings, telephone conferences and email communications would be used to delineate the GLIM approach. The article was accepted on the 2nd of August 2018 and was published in February 2019, at least where I managed to get hold of the article. So now that we've covered a brief history, let's move into the learning objectives. The learning objectives for this presentation are as follows. Number one is to list the four levels in the GLIM diagnostic scheme. Number two, list at least three screening tools and identify the populations they serve. Number three, identify the two criteria used in the diagnostic assessment. Number four, list the factors under each diagnostic criteria. Number five is to diagnose a patient with malnutrition according to the etiology. And lastly, number six is to classify the severity of malnutrition. So now that we've covered the learning objectives, let's move on to the GLIM diagnostic scheme. We'll begin with the risk screening. This level can be conducted by nurses and doctors, but also by dietitians when conducting routine screenings in the hospital and in the community. If your facility protocol includes nurses and doctors in the screening process, it's essential that the training is conducted regularly. Any validated screening tool can be used. And moving on to the second step, that is the diagnostic assessment. The diagnostic assessment is conducted on all patients at risk for malnutrition. This is usually covered by the dietitian and the assessment criteria includes a phenotypic and an etiological aspect um, where these have further divisions where we will get into it a bit later. The next level is to diagnose the patient. It's important that the pa patient must present with one phenotypic and one etiologic criterion in order to be classified according to the GLIM criteria. And lastly, we need to do a severity grading. To determine the severity, we only make use of the phenotypic criterion. The first step in the diagnostic scheme was the risk screening. As mentioned before, this step can be done by nurses and doctors if they have undergone training according to your facility screening protocol. The 
The mini nutritional assessment screening tool is widely used. However, it's mostly for the elderly population. You can make use of the malnutrition universal screening tool as well as a subjective global assessment. Both would be appropriate for adults. Please note that there are many screening tools available. Ensure that you're using a validated screening tool that's appropriate for your patient population. Next, we will be, dis we will be discussing the diagnostic assessment. Recall we spoke about the two criteria used in the diagnostic assessment, namely the phenotypic criteria and the etiologic criteria. The criteria listed under the phenotypic criteria is the non-volutional weight loss, which is also, can also be termed as unintentional weight loss, the low body mass index, and the reduced muscle mass. Under the etiologic criteria, we have reduced food intake or assimilation and disease burden or inflammatory condition. It's important that when you diagnose a patient, the patient meets at least one of the criteria from both groups. Now to go into more detail, we will begin with the phenotypic criteria. Recall that it includes the non-volutional weight loss, the low BMI, and reduced muscle mass. A patient meets the unintentional weight loss criteria for malnutrition if they have lost more than 5% of their body weight within the past six months, or if they have lost more than 10% beyond six months. This weight loss is unrelated unrelated to the patient's starting weight, therefore it can be used in patients with high BMIs. The only important factor that can't be stressed enough is that the patient must have lost the weight without the intention to lose it. Moving on to the BMI, if their BMI falls below 20 kilograms per meter squared and they are under 70 years old, then they meet the criteria. If the patient is 70 years old or above, their BMI should fall below 22. Please note that there is a different criteria for the Asian population, and that is less than 18.5 for under 70 years and under 20 for 70 years and above. Reduced muscle mass may be measured with any validated technique. The gold standard would be your DEXA scan, but bioelectrical impedance analysis, ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs, circumferences and skin folds may also be used to get to a body composition. Here is a table of examples of the recommended thresholds for reduced body mass. This table is, av is available in the article as well, but as you can see it highlights the thresholds for DEXA, bioelectrical impedance analysis, fat-free mass index and others. In our hospital, we do not have access to many of these measuring techniques, so we make use of the arm muscle area. Once calculated, you can identify the percentile for which the patient falls into. Wasted is classified as below the fifth percentile, and thus the patient would meet the criteria. Should you wish to use more, should you wish to be more cautious or go on a more cautious route, then you can actually include patients that fall between the 5th and 15th percentile. So from those three criteria mentioned, your patient should meet at least one of them, and then one of the etiological criteria, which we will discuss now. So the etiological criteria includes the following. Reduced food intake or assimilation, as well as inflammation. If your patient has been eating 50% or less of their estimated requirements for over a week or has any reduced intake for more than two weeks, then they meet the criteria. Note that if they have any chronic gastrointestinal condition that adversely impacts their food assimilation or absorption, such as short bowel syndrome, pancreatic insufficiency, esophageal strictures, gastroparesis, intestinal pseudo-obstruction and the like, then the patient also meets the criteria. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dysphagia, constipation and abdominal pains are also included in the criteria. 
inflammation or inflammatory markers such as fever, negative nitrogen balance, elevated resting energy expenditure, C-reactive protein, white blood cell counts, albumin and pre-albumin can be used to identify inflammation. Acute inflammation includes injuries such as major infections, burns, trauma and closed head injury, whereas your chronic inflammation is seen with chronic organ diseases such as um, your chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, some, something like your congestive cardiac failure, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, renal and also liver diseases. If your patient matches at least one of the two criteria and at least one of the three phenotypic criteria, then you can proceed to level three. And that is the diagnosis. Important to note is that the etiology based diagnosis classification is endorsed by the GLIM consistent with those suggested previously by the International Consensus Guideline Committee, the AND or ASPEN guidelines, as well as the ESPEN guidelines. So the diagnosis begins with malnutrition related to, and then it is followed by the etiology or the cause. One could be chronic disease with inflammation. Recall we spoke about the inflammatory markers, which are important to take note of. And we also spoke about the chronic conditions which can cause the chronic inflammation. Another diagnosis could be malnutrition related to chronic disease with minimal or no perceived inflammation. Another one is acute disease or injury with severe inflammation. Again, remember the conditions we mentioned. And lastly, um, Another diagnosis could be malnutrition related to starvation, including hunger or food shortage associated with socioeconomic or environmental factors. Once you have selected your diagnosis, you can then substantiate it with your signs and symptoms you've identified, which can be done by adding the as evidence by, which I will emphasize for you guys there. And then after you've, had, you've added the as evidence by, you can provide your signs and symptoms. So an example I've put here is malnutrition related to chronic disease with inflammation as evidenced by high C-reactive protein, low albumin, BMI less than 20 kilograms per meter squared. Or you can even be specific and say a BMI of 16 and then an arm muscle area less than the fifth percentile. I'm going to cover this more in my practical example video, um, which will be separate from this one. So just stay tuned for that. Now we will cover the last level, which is the severity grading. It is important to note that the severity classification only needs to meet one phenotypic criterion and that the severity is graded only on the phenotypic criteria not the etiologic criteria. So here we have our three phenotypic criteria listed. And here we have the severities which are stage one or moderate malnutrition and stage two or severe malnutrition. Moderate malnutrition is classified according to, if it is classified according to weight loss, is considered as 5 to 10% unintentional weight loss within six months or 10% beyond six months, 10 to 20% beyond six months. Severe malnutrition would be above 10% weight loss within six months or more than 20% beyond six months. If the severity is graded according to BMI, then moderate malnutrition would be a BMI below 20 if they are less than 17 or less than 22 if they are 70 years and above. Severe malnutrition would be a BMI below 18.5 if they are less than 70 years or less than 20 if they are 70 years and above. They made no reference to Asian specific populations regarding the severity so I would make use of the low BMI index used here 
or you can alternatively make use of the weight loss or reduced muscle mass if those are more severe. And then lastly, if the severity is graded according to the reduced muscle mass, then moderate malnutrition would have a mild to moderate deficit. If you're using arm muscle area, then these would be a patient that falls between the 5th and the 15th percentile, whereas severe malnutrition would be seen in a patient with severe deficits or an arm muscle area below the 5th percentile. Please note that if your patient falls into more than one criteria, then you would rate them according to the most severe grade. So that is all I have for you today. I hope you guys found this informative and that you'll be able to incorporate this into your practice. Don't forget to get your protocol and your article copy in the description box below. And here's the references that I used. So thank you and stay tuned for the video where I share my practical example with you all.